Hello, and thanks for listening to this reading of Hand of the Death God. Today's story is Brotherhood of the Black Star. This is probably the most popular story in my book, and I also think it's a pretty good contender for the book's best tale. In it, the heroes investigate a mysterious cult that's arisen in the city of Zaldramar. Is the Brotherhood of the Black Star what it seems on the surface, or does it hide something sinister beneath its facade? Uh, Well, of course you know it's the second of those two, but you might be surprised at what Akmotesh and his crew discover. I've decided to try something new in this reading by voicing Akmotesh with what I imagine a Chemish accent to sound like. I think this will make it a little easier to discern his dialogue from my my narration and maybe add a little bit of panache to the reading. Uh, Unfortunately, every foreign accent I try to imitate sounds either Eastern European or Russian, so you'll have to put up with that. In any case, I hope you enjoy the adventure. Here is Brotherhood of the Black Star. Please state your name for the tribunal. Akmotesh III. Your nation of origin? Kem. Very well. Akmotesh III of Kem, you stand before the official tribunal of the Church of Aeus, patron god of our great city, lord of the skies, and bringer of thunder, accused of the crime of promoting a foreign religion without official permission of the church. How do you plead? Akmotesh stood before the stern-faced priests of Aeus in their opulent halls of gold and marble. The white-robed figures of the tribunal sat behind a table of rich mahogany, their long, wrinkled faces glaring at him judgingly from beneath their mitres. Not guilty. Not guilty, echoed one of the priests. Then how do you account for your presence in our city? I do not come to propagate my faith, as you say. I only come as an agent of my god, Anubis, lord of the dead, master of tombs, to carry out his will. If this happens to draw others to my faith, then so be it. And what, asked another, is the will of your god? To ensure none are sent to the realm of the dead before Anubis wills it, and to ensure those who have been sent there stay there. You're talking in riddles, said the tribunal. Speak sense. My appointed tasks include caring for the sick and injured, stopping murderers, monsters, and villains, and destroying the undead. Undead? asked one of the clerics. Revenants and ghosts, explained another. Several of the priests muttered briefly among themselves before one spoke up. Have you ever killed in the name of your god? My mission is one of peace. I use force only when words fail, he said, before adding, words fail often. The tribunal fell into discussion, whispering covertly to one another, all while sending occasional suspicious glares Akmotesh's way. At length they ceased, and one spoke. Sir Akmotesh, we have discussed your situation, and we believe we may be able to enter into a mutually beneficial agreement. Have you heard of the Brotherhood of the Black Star? I have not. As you know, we of the Church of Aeus are uh, tolerant of other faiths, so long as they pay their proper uh, tribute to the master of the sky. Akmotesh suppressed a sigh. Though he was likewise tolerant of the cult of Aeus, he held their petty and vengeful god in no high regard, and he had little patience for their self-righteous pretenses. At least the cultists of Sibylle, though hedonistic and lacking in vision or discipline, didn't have ulterior motives of greed and self-advancement hidden behind a velvet curtain of civility and refinement. Uh, However, the priest continued, we have become aware of a clandestine and nascent cult operating in secret within the confines of the city. They operate on a cellular level. They have no defined house of worship, but rather meet in various secret locations. This, combined with the easily persuaded nature of the local guard, has made it extremely difficult for the church to collect the proper tribute from them. You want me to act as a tax collector? Akmotesh hoped this wasn't the case. It was clearly out of the question. No, said another member of the tribunal. That is a duty clearly below one with your level of prestige, he said patronizingly. I wish simple taxation were the foremost of our concerns. However, we have come to believe there may be more uh, insidious elements of the cult. You see, we have been getting reports from citizens whose friends and family have become involved and subsequently uh, disappeared. What we are asking, said another, is for you to try to infiltrate the Brotherhood of the Black Star and see if our concerns are legitimate. Agmotesh frowned as he considered the situation. Why do you need me? 
The clergy of the Church of Aeus are much too high profile to be able to infiltrate the cult ourselves. You, however, are a newcomer to our city. They will think you one of its many immigrants and won't give you a second thought. While it's true we could employ one of the Church's various uh, freelance agents, their loyalty is sometimes too easily influenced. We know that, as a fellow man of the gods, your commitment will be genuine. Also, while we will not offer you anything in the way of official payment, the Church is willing to forego any future sanctions on your practicing your faith within the city. A very generous offer, added one of the priests. Agmotesh's mind was made up. An alliance with the powerful Church of Aeus would certainly be advantageous in facilitating his work here, but he wouldn't have been surprised if, pragmatic bureaucrats that they were, they later reneged on the promise. He would have acquiesced even without this agreement, however, for if the Brotherhood of the Black Star was truly malign, as the Church suspected, it was just the sort of thing he had made it his sworn duty to thwart. The world was full of dangerous and bloodthirsty cults who were responsible for the wanton and wasteful consumption of human life, something that Anubis, as a benevolent god of death, despised. Akmotesh almost told the tribunal that he would have agreed to invest the, investigate the cult even had they not promised their alliance, but then thought better of it. I find your offer acceptable, he said. We suspected you would. You will be left to your own devices in this matter, and with only limited help from the Church of Aeus. Please understand, we cannot let it be known we are in alliance with you. If others see you communicating with us regularly, it would compromise your identity. Also, the Church prefers to keep its more covert business out of the public eye as much as possible. To this end, only contact us in the utmost of emergencies. Do you understand? Akmotesh nodded. Did they really think he was that foolish? In reality, it was quite the contrary, and he was glad the domineering and bureaucratic cult would be out of his devices. Good. With that being said, we can point you in the right direction for beginning your search. Speak with the house of Brevik Mar. He is one of the individuals to go missing. His family is known to be faithful to the church and requested our help in solving the disappearance. They may be able to give you a starting point for your investigation. Now, if there are no final matters, we wish you the best of luck, and may the God of the sky watch over you. The house of Brevik Mar was quite spacious, but conspicuously unfurnished. Its stone walls were devoid of decoration, and only simple tables and chairs of cheap wood could be found within. Fortunately, the abode was not without warmth, as a fire crackled on the nearby hearth, casting flickering shadows over the faces of the dour-faced Chemite and the cloaked middle-aged woman who sat before it. As you can see, Brevik left us with very little, the housewife explained as Akmotesh sipped from the pewter mug that had been offered to him. There was a time when we were very well off. Brevik had amassed a sizable fortune over the years, but all this began to change once he started making his nightly outings to the gambling dens. He lost it all by gambling? Akmotesh asked. Not quite. He lost half of it by gambling, Brevik's wife explained. The other half he gave away to that accursed brotherhood of the Black Star. She added, I'd rather he have lost it gambling. Akmotesh cocked his head questioningly. You see, as he became more and more enslaved by his addiction, he sought help. He said he found a group of people in town who wanted to help him get his life in order. The Brotherhood, Akmotesh stated. The Brotherhood. And at first it seemed to work. He stopped gambling away his money. But instead he became more and more involved in that cult. He was spending less and less time at home and more time with them. Eventually he started giving his money, our money, away to them. He said it was for a good cause. <laughs> What better cause is there than one owns family, I ask? Did he ever try to convince you to join the Brotherhood as well? Oh, he did, but I didn't want anything to do with it. I had met some of the members. They were nice enough, but there was just something about them that seemed wrong somehow. I couldn't quite place my finger on it. Anyway, once he had given away almost everything, he left. He said he had been chosen by Zerzelzig, whatever that means. He explained nothing more. That's all he said. The more he became involved in the cult, the more secretive he became. And then there were some other things he began, began doing that were strange. He insisted we remove anything made of copper or bronze from our home, and he refused to eat certain foods. He said they were unclean. What kinds of foods? Beef liver, mainly. Also, certain kinds of seeds and beans, shellfish, mushrooms, too. 
Agmotesh meditated on this information for a few moments, sipping from his mug pensively. At length he decided he had all the information he was going to get from Dara Mar, and he took his leave. It's probably too late for my husband, but I hope you stop this from happening to anyone else, she said. With Anubis's help I will. Also, Akmotesh paused before leaving the abode. Please forget we ever spoke. The smell of smoke, sweat, and blood permeated the air, and unwashed bodies pushed and crowded all around Akmotesh, struggling for a better view of the pit wherein one man sat astride another, buffeting his opponent with a hail of savage punches. As Akmotesh watched, he recalled the time when he had been forced to do something similar, placed into a great arena on display before a crowd roaring for blood, facing off with a casked nemesis intent on ending the Chemish priest's life. He shook off the memory. It was something he preferred not to think about at this moment. Luckily for the two men in the pit, this fight wouldn't be one to the death, and both would walk away to fight another day, albeit with maybe a few less teeth. It was a lurid display of violence for public entertainment regardless, and Akmotesh took little interest in the spectacle. He wouldn't have been there at all were it not for his mission. This was the same venue where Brevik Mar had squandered his life's fortune, wagering odds on victors and losers, and it was here, Akmotesh reasoned, where agents of the Brotherhood of the Black Star kept their eyes open for those with a desperate disposition that made them vulnerable to the cult's promise of betterment. For several nights, Akmotesh had come here, placing heavy bets on the outcomes of the games in the hope it would attract attention. The crowd roared as one fighter collapsed in an unconscious bloody heap in the mud of the pit. The other raised his arms, turning to and fro as he drank in the applause of the crowd. Payouts and debts were exchanged. Alone, growled the greasy-haired, scar-faced clerk who hunkered over a marred table. What do you think this is? A lending house? A charity? But you don't understand. The artifact I gave. I can't bear to part with it. It's been in my family many years, Akmotesh pleaded. The small gold statuette was indeed valuable, one of countless pieces of loot the cleric had appropriated during his many years of conquering villains and thieves. Though he had little want for such trinkets himself, they did have their uses, and this was one such instance. "'You bet it! It's gone now!' the clerk retorted. "'Now get out of here before we break your skull!' A large, shirtless, heavily muscled man stepped forward, brandishing a spiked club the girth of a man's leg and studded with nails." Akmotesh feigned a despondent sigh and walked away. As he did, a man, whom he noticed standing a short distance away and watching the whole exchange with a keen interest, followed. He was a mildly handsome, fairly innocuous-looking individual, short, modest hair, and a simple gray robe augmented this impression. Akmotesh had seen him previous nights and had likewise been observing him. His suspicions were confirmed when the man spoke. "'Excuse me, friend,' the stranger said in a voice that was confident yet respectful. Akmotesh turned to face him. The robed figure continued, "'I couldn't help but overhear your conversation over there. It sounds like you've fallen into hard times. Let me give you some advice that might save your hide,' Akmotesh said curtly. "'In places like this, it's best to mind your own business.' Confident his acting was convincing, he made as though to shrug the man off and continue on through the throng of people." He was pleased when the man persisted. "'I know how these places are,' continued the stranger. "'I know because I was once like you. I had lost almost everything that was important to me, and then I found aid. Unless you're going to help me come up with a lot of money very quickly, I doubt any help you have to offer.' The man hurried around to look the priest in the face, and his gaze was one of genuine sincerity. Akmotesh could see why these agents were so successful at recruitment. "'You're right.' I can't help you get your money back, but I can help you make it so you won't lose any more. Just listen to what I have to say. Akmotesh stared silently. There's a group of people in this city who are dedicated to making people's lives better. If you join us, we can make yours better too. Give you something to live for. Here, take this. The man handed Akmotesh a small rolled up piece of parchment. It'll tell you how to get in contact with us. With that, the stranger raised the robe of his hood and walked back into the crowd. Akmotesh pocketed the parchment with a sly smile and left. Akmotesh followed the directions on the scroll, knocking on the back door of a small trading business during the hours of the night and uttering the phrase, The Black Star Guides Us. He had abandoned his traditional Chemish makeup and garments, going under the guise of Assam el Saif, a traveler from the Orient. 
Upon arrival, he joined a small group of others who had also been guided to the place. Each of them was given a plain gray robe to wear, and there, in the candlelight, amid bolts of cloth, crates of tableware, and stacks of furs, they sat on the stone floor listening to the robed figure who stood before them. The figure raised his hands. Men and women of Zaldramar, you have come from many different backgrounds, but all of you have something in common. Each of you seeks something, something you cannot find in your everyday lives, in your work, your pleasures and vices, your relationships, or even your gods. Let it be known that you are not the first to feel lost in your lives, nor will you be the last. Let it be known also that others have shared your experiences and found answers. It is for this reason the Brotherhood of the Black Star exists. Now, think for a moment of the gods. Which god do you pray to? Aeus? Misericord? Maybe you worship the old gods like Krolmek or Sebeli. Maybe the Jinn and the Jan. He glanced in Akmotesh's direction as he said this last one. Now answer me this. Do you feel they listen? So often I hear people lament of the gods. They pray but never receive an answer. And of course, the gods are countless years away on their divine thrones in their heavens. But what if I told you there was a god who was with us here on earth and that it was possible to meet it? The man identified himself as Ostrich, and he was to be the group's mentor and guide as they learned the ways of the Brotherhood of the Black Star. Ostrich taught to them the shocking nature of the cult. Their patron god, known as Zerzelzig, resided in the earthly realm. Here it wished to become one with its followers, but lifetimes dedicated to the pursuit of worldly pleasures had made mankind unsuitable. It was therefore necessary for them to purify themselves through devotion to Zerzelzig, to which end the Brotherhood of the Black Star had been created. Those who managed to cleanse themselves would eventually be called to meet their god face to face and become one with it. Akmotesh thought it unusual that the cult referred to their god as it, rather than ascribing any sort of anthropomorphic attributes, where they could live lives of eternal bliss and divinity. To Akmotesh, the whole concept sounded unsettling and disturbing, but as he glanced at those around him, he saw haggard faces lit by the glimmer of hope. Such was the nature of desperation. Ostrich went on to explain the history behind the Brotherhood, that Zerzelzig was a being from beyond the darkness beyond, who had traversed the blackness of the void to bring enlightenment to mankind. As mankind was not yet ready for its advent, however, it chose among them a representative, a man named Ushtar Nin, to serve as its high priest. It was Ushtar Nin who was the guiding force behind the Brotherhood of the Black Star and the custodian of the high temple where Zerzelzig itself resided. Those who prove themselves worthy in the eyes of Ushtar Nin and Zerzelzig will be invited to the high temple. There, you will prepare yourselves for the imminent time when you will come face to face with Zerzelzig itself. Ostrich explained in a voice that resonated with both comfort and conviction. Where is the high temple? Akmotesh asked. He knew asking too many questions could give him away as an infiltrator, but he threw caution to the wind. That is a closely guarded secret, my brother, Ostrich explained. As you may know, there are those who wish to see the Brotherhood of the Black Star disbanded, petty and close-minded individuals who who see us as a threat to their power, individuals who have become so corrupt and tied to this world that they refuse the salvation we offer. Even now, the Church of Aeus persecutes us, forcing us to pay taxes and tribute to their god. What right have they to make such demands of us? Akmotesh did, at least, share the Brotherhood's dislike for the Aeus cult's behavior regarding other religions. Ostrich told them that, in order to guard the cult from the threat of sabotage, the location of the high temple was given only to those who proved themselves worthy. It appeared Akmotesh had a long road ahead of him. The gathering was concluded by a brief summary. As the initiates learned to give up the things that bound them to the earthly world, vices, sources of stress, anger, and sorrow, they would purify themselves, and their lives would become better as a result. They were told, after leaving that night, they should contemplate on what they had learned, returning the next week if they wished to further their enlightenment. The next meeting was held in a different location, the basement of an archives building filled with tomes and scrolls. There were more people at this meeting, as the group of neophytes was gradually being adopted by the rest of the cult. Here, the teachings from the first night's meeting were reinforced, and the initiates were also taught the other commandments of the faith that the livers of animals must not be consumed, as well as certain shellfish, seeds, and mushrooms. They were also told to avoid adorning themselves with copper or bronze, as it was considered a corrupt metal.
After several weeks, Akmotesh was invited to attend his first formal worship gathering of the Brotherhood of the Black Star. It was held in one of the many secret chambers that honeycombed the network of aqueducts and catacombs beneath the city. There, a congregation of robed and hooded cultists gathered to worship their false god. Praise is an approbation to Zerzelzig, the living god, shouted the priest in charge of the ceremony. Zerzelzig, Zerzelzig, cried the congregation. Akmotesh said nothing, hiding behind his hood in uncomfortable silence. And praises and approbation to Ushtarnin, its divine mouthpiece. Glory to Ushtarnin, its chosen priest, chanted the crowd. Though Akmotesh reminded himself that he was only an observer, as a devotee of Anubis, he couldn't help feeling his presence there was somewhat blasphemous. More time passed. Though Akmotesh tried to remain discreet, the nature of his service to Anubis was bound to make this difficult, and inevitably a night came when someone, a newcomer, recognized him. I remember you, said a young and frail man in attendance at one of the smaller gatherings. I saw you on the streets trying to cure someone of the pox. Akmotesh's heart froze momentarily, but he regained his composure. I think you are mistaken, my brother. I am only a humble immigrant from the east. I am almost sure it was you. I heard you invoke the name of Anubis. Anubis is a god of Chem, explained Akmotesh. I think you must be getting one foreigner confused with another. This seemed to diffuse the situation temporarily, but Akmotesh noticed Ostrich watching the interchange with keen and suspicious eyes. Later, Akmotesh wondered to himself, by claiming he was not of Chem, was he then denying Anubis as his god? He bit his lip. Perhaps it had not been wise to agree to this mission. "'Brother Assam, said Ostrich, approaching Akmotesh one night after the gathering had commenced, "'I noticed that at our last worship you were silent while the others spoke.' I am silent by nature, Akmotesh said simply, adding, perhaps a trait instilled in me by my tribe. Hmm, I see. Brother Assam, can I be assured of your devotion to the Brotherhood? Of course. Do you pledge your devotion to the Brotherhood of the Black Star? Yes. Do you renounce all other gods, worshipping only Zerzelzig? Akmotesh balked at this last question. He would not, could not, answer yes, lest he betray Anubis. He thought quickly. You know as well as I, Brother Ostrich, what fate befalls those who speak ill of the gods. Though I can assure you of my devotion to the Brotherhood, it is fools talk to invoke their anger. He added, the jinn of the eastern sands are especially vengeful. I see. Well, perhaps you don't have quite the faith in our god as others do. No matter. As the Brotherhood continues to guide you, you will grow in conviction. At the gathering the next week, they were cautioned of the danger of intruders into the faith. My brothers, said the cultist leading the night's proceedings, many of you have grown in faith through the brotherhood, and many of you have seen your lives take on new meaning as you grow closer to Zerzelzig. But as some of you may know, there are those who wish to see our brotherhood destroyed, greedy and corrupt slaves of the powers that control this city, making its dwellers as puppets to dance at their whims. I ask you, then, to be ever vigilant and watch for those among us who may be covert agents of these powers, for they seek to infiltrate even our ranks. Should you suspect one of your fellow brothers or sisters of conspiring with the rulers of the city, it is your duty to report their presence to your elders. I leave you, then, with one last thought. These days we are fighting a secret war, a war to keep our faith. I call upon each of you to be soldiers in this war by always being on the watch for enemies within and without, and I ask you this, if the time comes when you are called upon to do battle for the Brotherhood of the Black Star, for our god Zerzelzig and Ushtarnin, its holy mouthpiece, will you answer the call?'